I think this organization was born at 75, if I'm not mistaken, in 975. Indeed, with heads of states, mostly from the military. In any case, as far as the AES is concerned, they were all military. It was a desire to integrate people to ensure the development of the economy, solidarity, mutual aid. Overall, the Pan-Africanist virtues which have led the heads of states. The organization has lost its values. And today, the observation is clear. I think that for over a decade, the sister republics of Mali and Niger are at war against terrorism and in Burkina, almost a decade we are at war. This organization which was supposed therefore to create mutual aid and solidarity has failed. We have never received any help from this organization, no soldiers, no logistics, no compassion. In delivering these resolute statements, Ibrahim Traore meticulously underscored the myriad vulnerabilities plaguing the economic community of the West African states known as the ECOWAS exposing its inadequacies in safeguarding member states against a litany of recurrent challenges spanning the gamut from terrorism and violent extremism to piracy, political instability, elections-related violence, drug trafficking, and the ominous specter of deadly viruses. Hello everyone to my channel and welcome. In fact, real quick, if you are into Pan-Africanism, African politics, trends in economy, and African society, trust me, you are the right place. In this video, we are actually going to take a deep dive into the heart and soul of Burkina Faso's emancipation from the ECOWAS. And in fact, if you're following African trends, then you realize that it's not news that the ECOWAS has come under scrutiny several times for failing to help its member states in times of crisis. Now, during this recent interview, which happened between Captain Ibrahim Traoré and the famous journalist Alain Foucault, Ibrahim Traoré had the opportunity to express himself on why he was determined to pull out his country and uh, Niger and Mali all together from the ECOWAS and many other interesting views. Captain Ibrahim Traoré actually made his declaration on February 6, 2024, expressing his displeasure with the ECOWAS and his subsequent request to leave the organization of the West African states. Burkina Faso would therefore accompany Mali and Niger in this abroad retreat. But you would ask yourself, why did this hasty decision come about? And why is the president of Burkina Faso's transition team siding with Mali and Niger to leave the ECOWAS? The truth is, the ECOWAS has lost a lot of support from some West African governments. Dr. Asante Asa, a well-known lecturer at the Political Science University in Ghana, recently declared that ECOWAS leaders must stop their hypocrisy as concerning political leadership. The word hypocrisy is highlighted here. You see, there's no reason for criticism in light of Burkina Faso's military leaders' incapable record of duty consciousness and patrimony. On September 30th, 2022, Ibrahim Traoré declared Damimba to be fired and stage a coup d'etat to seize power. In that year, the nation had witnessed two purges, including this one. You see, Lieutenant Colonel Damibia became the president of the MPSR on January 24, 2022, after President Rock Mark Christian Kabore was overthrown in a coup d'etat that included Captain Chari among its participants. The trend of coup d'etat was quite rampant. On the 10th of September, though, these officials chose to remove President Damibia from office due to the deteriorating security environment and the disregard for the agreement made during the first coup d'etat. Following the tumultuous events, Ibrahim Traoré ascended to the position of head of the MPSR, marking a significant juncture in Burkina Faso's political landscape. Now, this transition of power came in the wake of several devastating terrorist attacks, notably the likes of the tragedy in Kaskinde, where a convoy was ambushed by terrorists, resulting in the loss of no less than 11 soldiers and leaving numerous civilians unaccounted for. Now, while official reports documented the toll, alternative sources suggested an even higher civilian death toll, painting a grim picture of the security situation in the region. On October 6, a pivotal movement unfolded as a fundamental act was enacted. It was heralding the restoration of the constitution and affirming Chari as the country's head of states. Yay, everybody was happy about that. But you see, this historic development marked Chari as the first Muslim leader to assume this role since the overthrow of Saezebo in 1982, underscoring the significance of his ascension to power in Burkina Faso's contemporary history. In his newfound role, Traoré wasted no time in addressing the pressing issues facing the nation. With a keen focus on governance and stability, he did initiate meetings on October 14, 2022, just a few months after, in fact, like a month after he came to power to deliberate on the appointment of a president for the transition, be it from civilian or military ranks. Amidst growing support from his loyalists, well, you know, who organized demonstrations advocating for his leadership, Chari's stature continued to rise, culminating in his appointment as head of the transition by virtue of his presidency of the MPSR. This pivotal movement was formalized on October 21st 
and then Traore was officially invested the powers of the president of the transition by the Constitutional Council. This was signaling a new chapter in Burkina Faso's political trajectory under his leadership. So he's come a long way. In November 2022, he renounced the presidential salary but retained his captain salary. And for once, you'd want to ask yourself how many presidents in Africa could do that. Now, this is not to really justify why he's leaving the ECOWAS, but this gives us a little idea of where he comes from, the background, and his, the legitimacy of his um, rights to being the leader of Burkina Faso at this point in time. On the historic date of February 3rd, 2023, Ibrahim Traore, in a momentous address to the nation, unveiled a comprehensive strategy aimed at combating the looming threat posed by jihadist forces, rallying the populace to stand united in support of this critical endeavor. And as the month of April dawned, Traore took decisive action by decreeing a state of general mobilization. He was marshalling the nation's resources and manpower for the impending battle against extremism. At this point in time, it's very clear that his resources and efforts are geared towards fighting the war against all forms of jihadism and terrorism in the nation. That's a feat that Damiba failed to pull through. In the ensuing weeks, of course, Tari embarked on diplomatic outreach campaigns, cementing ties with the consortium of friendly nations committed to bolstering Burkina Faso's military capabilities. Notably, among these partners were Russia, whose Wagner paramilitary contingent held the promise of reinforcing Burkina Faso's defense apparatus. And we're going to see this in detail in some time to come in the script. Turkey, a steadfast ally, provided vital support in the form of Biocrafter TB2 drones and North Korea, recognized as a reliable arms supply in Traore's strategic calculus. Despite the alley of external assistance, Traore maintained a steadfast commitment to utilizing domestic forces in the ongoing counterterrorism efforts. He was assuring reliant on Wigner's Russians for the very first time being. Determined to escalate the fight against terrorism, Chari's administration orchestrated an unprecedented recruitment drive, enlisting 3,000 non-commissioned soldiers and mobilizing an additional 50,000 volunteers dedicated to safeguarding the nation's territorial integrity. Now, you may ask yourself at this point in time, where is France? Well, we'll see that in some time to come in the video. But then, the fiscal landscape pointed a sobering picture as the state's budget grappled with the crippling impact of economic sanctions imposed on Burkina Faso. In a bid to shore up resources for the war against jihadists, the government actually found itself compelled to implement tax hikes, enlisting mixed reactions from the populace grappling with economic fallout. Boasted by seasoned leadership, Traore has emerged as a charismatic figure resonating particularly with the youth demographic, constituting over 70% of the population, yet solely underrepresented in political spheres. He is actually rumored to have been role modeled by Thomas Sankara, his idol. Drawing inspiration from the timeless ideals espoused by Sankara, Traore championed the cause of national sovereignty and vehemently opposed imperialism, garnering widespread support from Pan-Africanists and Wahhabis, so to say, who found solace in his unwavering commitment to their shared values. It is patently clear that Ibrahim Traore's intent is not merely to perpetually illuminate the weaknesses inherent within the ECOWAS, but rather to shield his people and the broader African community from the multifarious trials they confront. Foremost among the hurdles confronting ECOWAS is the glaring lack of institutional capacity and resources, a persistent impediment that severely constrains the organization's ability to translate its lofty aspirations into tangible outcomes. You get what I mean? Confronted with meager financial resources, bureaucratic bottlenecks, and frail administrative frameworks, uh, more like the, you know, the OAU before it became the United Nations, ECOWAS finds itself grappling with the Herculean task of effectively coordinating regional policies and initiatives, thereby engendering chasms in implementation and enforcement at the national level. In addition to the formidable obstacles of institutional frailty, ECOWAS grapples with the specter of political instability and governance deficits rampant within the member states, with many West African nations wrestling with the specter of political unrest, there's corruption, and there's the erosion of democratic norms. Such internal features severely undermine ECOWAS's overarching objective of fostering peace, security, and even good governance across the region, exacerbating tensions and discord over matters of decision-making and policy implementation. Then there's more to that. ECOWAS is beset by a litany of challenges about regional security and conflict resolution in general. That means there's a proliferation of armed groups, transnational crime syndicates, and terrorist organizations posing grave threats to the stability and socioeconomic development of West Africa and in the member states of the ECOWAS. 
Despite the establishment of mechanisms like the ECOWAS standby force and the Mediation and Security Council and all that stuff to tackle security challenges head on, the organization's capacity to mount effective responses to crises and conflicts it still needs to be improved. Consequently, ECOWAS often finds itself compelled to seek assistance from external stakeholders, including the United Nations and regional powers. So it means the ECOWAS is some kind of um, not self-sufficient to intervene and mitigate the repercussions of the gaining crisis across the region. And this is actually Traoré's point of view. Moreover, ECOWAS contends with significant economic disparities and divergent levels of development across member states, just to mention a few. While certain nations have witnessed robust economic growth and progress, others have grappled persistently with entrenched poverty, underdevelopment and the death of essential services. So you see that there is this level of imbalance between the, favor, the favors that get through the nations in the ECOWAS. This glaring economic asymmetry will not only pose formidable hurdles in the long run to come, but it has its overarching goals of regional integration and also serves to exacerbate social tensions and intensify migration pressures within the region. That means you are in the ECOWAS, but you want to find yourself outside there, thus accentuating the socioeconomic fault lines that undermine collective prosperity and stability. At this point, I think it's safe to say that member states in the ECOWAS are not all that satisfied, well for a few that are the giants. In fact, as the ongoing discourse deliberates whether the incumbent head of state of Burkina Faso, our Captain Ibrahim Chari, of course, will retract his bid to withdraw from ECOWAS, the three nations involved, Mali, Faso and Niger, have articulated three primary rationales for their decisions to exit the regional bloc known as the ECOWAS. Foremost among these reasons is the vehement objection to what they perceive as illegal, illegitimate, inhumane and irresponsible actions. There's a lot of either. Leave it against them for purportedly undermining democratic processes within their respective countries. But that's not all. Secondly, they lament ECOWAS's perceived failure to provide substantive assistance in their existential battle against terrorism and insecurity. These pressing security challenges are really enormous. Furthermore, the ruling juntas in these nations have advanced the argument that ECOWAS has strayed from its foundational principles and is now beholden to external influences, asserting that the organization is unduly influenced by foreign powers rather than serving the interests of its member states. In a bid to uphold democratic norms and preserve the integrity of its founding principles, ECOWAS adopted a protocol on democracy and good governance in 2001. This included provisions for addressing unconstitutional changes of government. This was good, actually. Article 1A of this protocol unequivocally espouses a zero tolerance for power obtained or maintained by unconstitutional means, providing the legal basis for ECOWAS decision to suspend the three countries and impose sanctions upon them. The way it gets bad there is that most of the clauses in the charter are not respected and only a few like this one mentioned are put into place when it comes to the sanctions. So ECOWAS has made its stance abundantly clear, asserting its refusal to engage with the ruling regimes and emphasizing its steadfast commitment to deterring military coups within the bloc. Moreover, the regional bloc expresses palpable frustration at the perceived lack of commitment exhibited by the three nations in returning to democratic governments, urging them to furnish clear and definitive transition timetables, particularly in the case of Mali, Burkina Faso, to facilitate a smooth and expeditious return to democratic rule. But the challenge with Burkina Faso is that Ibrahim Traore does clearly say that there's no way to get back into a, 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 a general constitutional democratic rule when the crisis is still ongoing in Burkina Faso because the member, the, the, the citizens of the nation have to vote and they cannot vote when there's such insecurity. Well, what do you think about this? You could drop in the comment section below as we proceed. Let's look at some impacts uh, that this will cause for Burkina Faso with its withdrawal from the ECOWAS. The foremost repercussions, I believe, will undoubtedly manifest in the realm of trade and economic development. You see, the point is, the ECOWAS foundational identity as an economic community is very important and that means member states enjoy a lot of benefits. Pulling out from the ECOWAS is not going to come without repercussions. The departure of any member state is pushed significantly impinge upon trade dynamics and hinder overall economic progress within the region. In quantifiable terms, the collective withdrawal of the three nations translates into a discernible dent in ECOWAS's economic landscape, with these countries jointly contributing 8% to the colossal $761 billion gross domestic product of the regional bloc. Furthermore, the trade statistics for the year 2022 underscore the pivotal role played by these nations as the total trade volume within the ECOWAS region 
amounted to substantial 277.22 billion US dollars, signifying their integral participation in intra-regional trade network. Now imagine pulling out of the ECOWAS. The looming specter of their departure poses a palpable threat to the smooth flow of goods and services across the member states, potentially disrupting established trade routes and supply chains, thereby shaming the economic momentum that underspins regional integration efforts. Beyond the immediate economic ramifications, the envisaged exit carries a slew of additional consequences that reverberate across various sectors. You want to notice primarily the specter of economic collapse within the departure of the countries. In fact, there will be the strategic significance, particularly in domains like food security, it renders them indispensable contributors to regional stability. Niger's status as a key onion supplier and Burkina Faso's role as a significant exporter of tomatoes underscore their pivotal roles in sustaining agricultural production and ensuring food self-sufficiency within the sub-region. There's going to be a real discrepancy. Furthermore, the potential exodus of citizens from these nations to other ECOWAS countries emerges as a possible pressing concern, amplifying socioeconomic strains and exacerbating demographic pressures, thereby posing a formidable challenge to the stability and question of the regional bloc. Moreover, fears abound regarding the possibility of the departing countries forging bilateral alliances with external factors, because once they are out, then they need partners that may not necessarily align with the interests of the other ECOWAS member states. For instance, apprehensions linger over Niger's beginning ties with Russia following its estrangement from France, raising questions about the geopolitical implications of such alignments on regional dynamics. Amidst these multifaceted repercussions, one must recognize the pivotal question regarding the individual impacts on each of the concerned nations. Chief among these repercussions is the profound effect on the movement of people, goods, and services, with the potential for significant disruptions across various facets of the economic life within these countries. The point is, in the framework of the ECOWAS, member states benefit from privileges of unhindered movement of their citizens across the bloc's borders, fostering a sense of regional integration and facilitating cross-border socioeconomic interactions. This freedom entails that citizens of ECOWAS countries possess the right to reside and seek employment in any member state. A prime example of this interconnectivity is evidenced by the sizable population of over 5 million individuals hailing from Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger who have established their livelihoods within Côte d'Ivoire alone. Similarly, countries such as Ghana, Togo and the Republic of Benin serve as hosts to significant numbers of Nigerian uh, migrants highlighting the depth of intra-regional migration facilitated by ECOWAS protocols. However, the envisaged withdrawal from ECOWAS threatens to upend this seamless mobility paradigm, and particularly for citizens of landlocked nations. Should the exit materialize, individuals from these countries would encounter barriers to travel within the ECOWAS member states, effectively curtailing their freedom of movement and impeding their access to cross-border opportunities, notably Niger. Within its extensive border spanning over 1,600 kilometers and its heavy reliance on trade with Nigeria, it stands to bear the brunt of such restrictions as the imposition of sanctions by ECOWAS has already begun to precipitate hardships for its populace. But the point is, will these nations prove their resilience? Moreover, the economic repercussions of the exit extend beyond mobility constraints as the future relationship between ECOWAS and the departing countries could entail further restrictions on the exchange of goods and services. Such constraints, if they are imposed, would exert additional strain on the economies of these nations and it would actually exacerbate existing socioeconomic challenges and impede their prospects for growth and development. Looking at the security dynamics, the immediate impact may appear muted because existing security arrangements are unlikely to undergo any significant alterations in the short term. But then, the long term implications are more ominous as the withdrawal jeopardizes prospects for robust security cooperation among ECOWAS member states. This is particularly concerning given the limited collaboration that exists uh, is observed among the departing countries and other ECOWAS members. This is amplified by collective withdrawal from initiatives such as the G5 Sahel, which has participated in the collapse of the regional security frameworks. Now, despite citing the lack of security assistance from ECOWAS as a pivotal reason for their decision to exit the organization, the ramifications of a complete breakdown in existing security infrastructure extend far beyond the borders of the departing countries, impacting other relatively stable states within the region. Nations like Ghana, Côte d'Ivoire, Togo, Benin, while not directly involved in the Alliance of Sahel states, they formed the departing trio, and they could nonetheless experience ripple effects among the deteriorating security situation in the broader West African region. 
Now, the Alliance of Sahel, which is Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, represents a concerned effort by these three states to address the uprising security challenges, the absence of support from established regional bodies like the ECOWAS. It leaves them vulnerable to insurgencies. It's true that Burkina Faso is already handling most of that, but then it could continue if they don't have all the workforce and even the, the, the military might to bear the burden of that restraint. It undermines also their capacity to contain the threats effectively. This underscores the interconnected nature of security dynamics in the region. You see, the destabilization of one country can completely reverberate across borders, and this will definitely not go unnoticed. Presently, there's the presence of the African Corps. It was formerly known as the Wagner Group and is backed by Russian support in Mali, and Burkina Faso underscores the continued reliance on external assistance to combat insecurity. Despite initial reluctance, Burkina Faso eventually acquiescing to the deployment of foreign mercenaries has signaled the ongoing need for external support to bolster domestic security efforts. Additionally, Niger's recent agreement on military cooperation with Russia further emphasizes the reliance on external actors to address security challenges within the region. However, the effectiveness of external support remains contingent on various factors, and this includes the geopolitical landscape and competing international priorities. With Russia embroiled in a significant conflict in Ukraine, its capacity to provide extensive support to West African countries may be constrained, leaving the region vulnerable to escalating security threats. Now, should the Alliance of Sahel states falter in efforts to combat insurgency and restore stability, it's clear that the ramifications could extend beyond the immediate region. And this is going to pose a threat to the border stability of the ECOWAS bloc and potentially it will spill into the neighboring territories and that way it becomes dangerous. So therefore, the imperative for coercive regional security frameworks and concerted national support will remain paramount in addressing the complex security challenges facing West Africa. ECOWAS officials have expressed their willingness to engage in dialogue with the three countries. It's left to see whether the heads of state of these three countries will respond favorably according to the ECOWAS standards. Offering concessions to prevent their departure would serve the best interests of both the bloc and all citizens of ECOWAS member states. Prior to Ibrahim Traoré's assumption of power, the situation in Burkina Faso was really dire. In recent years, the country has grappled with a significant terrorism challenge, particularly in its northern and eastern regions. This surge in terrorist activities is largely attributed to the proliferation of jihadist groups affiliated with the likes of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State or the ISIS, operating in the Sahel region. Exploiting existing ethnic tensions, socioeconomic disparities, and weak governance structures, these groups have sought to establish a stronghold and carry out attacks targeting both civilians and security forces. So the security situation in Burkina Faso began to deteriorate around 2015, with jihadist groups gaining traction and expanding their influence. Attacks on military installations, public infrastructure, and civilian populations became more frequent. In fact, it was participating in a humanitarian crisis and the internal displacement of thousands of individuals. In response to the escalating terrorism between Burkina Faso and the wider Sahel region, France, the then partner of Burkina Faso, launched Operation Bakane in 2014. This military intervention actually aimed to combat terrorist groups, provide security assistance to local governments, and promote stability in the region. French forces, alongside the troops from other European nations and regional allies, engaged in counterterrorism operations intelligence gathering, and many more capacity-building initiatives to enhance uh, the capacity of local security forces. But the thing is, Operation Bakane has achieved only some small success in disrupting terrorist activities and thwarting attacks. And that's why the situation remains intricate and doubting, at least until the advent of Ibrahim Traoré. Factors like porous borders, expansive harsh terrain, deep-rooted socioeconomic grievances persistently have contributed to insecurity in Burkina Faso and neighboring nations. There were also the critics of France's intervention, which contend that it has not adequately tackled the underlying causes of terrorism in the area and could potentially lead to unintended consequences like civilian casualties and heightened radicalization. Also, there are apprehensions regarding the long-term viability of military solutions and a growing cognition of the necessity for comprehensive strategies that prioritize development, governance, and community involvement to effectively address the fundamental drivers of extremism. In essence, the situation in Burkina Faso underscores the pressing need for a holistic and multifaceted approach to counterterrorism. Such an approach should blend military endeavors with diplomatic initiatives, development programs, and humanitarian actions to foster enduring peace and stability throughout the entire Sahel region. 
Regarding the current relationship between Burkina Faso and Russia, Captain Trari candidly expressed his views. He highlighted the historical ties between the two nations. He emphasized that Burkina Faso has maintained a long-standing relationship with Russia, with a significant portion of the country's equipment historically sourced from Russia. He also alluded to a period of distortion in the 90s due to structural adjustment programs during which Burkina Faso's military capabilities were compromised, symbolized by soldiers resorting to standard guard with makeshift implements. Several years ago, people simply adorned themselves in their attire, unaware of the looming presence of terrorism, which later joined the scene like an unwelcome guest at a dance. In fact, this narrative echoes various media platforms, portraying the inability of authorities to effectively combat terrorism while the threat continues to escalate. Presently, Burkina Faso's relationship with Russia is primarily strategic, a fact that resonates more profoundly than words can convey. These are the exact words of Burkina Faso's President Ibrahim Traoré. Unlike other nations that impose constraints on Burkina Faso, Ibrahim Traoré said during the interview that Russia stands out as a reliable partner, offering a wide array of equipment for purchase without hesitation. Captain Ibrahim Traoré also said in his point and emphasized that Russia is willing to fulfill Burkina Faso's procurement needs, unlike other countries that impose limitations on weapon sales, like you cannot buy lethal weapons, you probably have to pick stones and maybe the stones are lethal. The intricates of international relations often paint a complex picture, one that is often misconstrued by the media. Despite widespread misconceptions suggesting that Burkina Faso is battering or selling its lands and resources in exchange for Russia's assistance, Captain Ibrahim Chari vehemently refutes all of such claims. Instead, he highlights the mutuality and the benefits of the partnership that ex exists and blossoms between Burkina Faso and Russia since November 7, 2022. In fact, according to reports from Lemonet.fr, the Burkina Bay government has demonstrated numerous gestures of goodwill towards Moscow, fostering collaboration across various domains and vice versa. That said, we come to the end of this video, but there's more to this and if you'd like to watch the next part of this exclusivity, please be sure to click the card on your screen and you'll get more on this. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and see you in the next one.